The Bruce Kelly CW Memorial Contest is held every December. This year we had a lot of participants I'd never heard before. People are starting to build 1929 style breadboard transmitters and they're getting on the air. The quickest way to get on the air with one of these transmitters that are built in the 1929 style is with the Type 27 triode. Now this Type 27 triode is still very inexpensive. You can probably get two or three of them for ten to twelve dollars. So this is the quick, easy, and inexpensive way to get on a Hartley oscillator or a Pitts oscillator or a TNT or a tune plate tune grid type. This is a great little tube to get you started. And you can get two to three watts out of this uh, out of this triode with a very modest plate voltage of between 150 and 200 volts. So this video is all about building your first, maybe your first tube type project, a 1929 style Hartley oscillator. I've been asked to do this uh, repeatedly and I just wanted to make sure that I got this in in early uh, 2024 as my first video of the year because it's something that people asked for last year and I let it slip by. Now I w attended the Antique Wireless Association's uh, conference this summer and I happened to go out in the flea market and I picked up this box of parts for five bucks. Look at these beautiful phone jacks from the 1920s. whole bunch of old vernier dials that can be restored, contacts, all kinds of uh, terminal strips. Five dollars. So keep your eyes open for the old time parts. So you are basically looking at everything you need to build a 1929 style Hartley or Coal Pits oscillator. We have the very inexpensive Type 27 tube. The Type 27 tube usually can be picked up for three or four dollars. So get a couple of them, and uh, this will produce between 1 and 3 watts output, depending on how you build this thing. It's a fun way to start uh, in the 1929 transmitter game and be able to participate in the Bruce Kelly 1929 QSO party. So it doesn't look like a lot of parts, and it really isn't. You don't have to use period parts. You only have to use a tube type that was developed before 1929. You want to get a hold of a good length of copper tubing as your main coil. You know, get about 10 feet of this to wind into a coil. You're going to need some stiff hookup wire. You're going to need the 5-pin tube socket for the Type 27 tube. Some type of tuning capacitor. Start out with something like this. You don't have to have a giant capacitor to start. You can start with a regular broadcast variable. And uh, let's start building a Type 27 Hartley or Coal Pits oscillator. Who says you have to have period parts? Basically, you use what you've got and you make your first Hartley transmitter or Coal Pits oscillator transmitter. You need a 5-pin tube socket, some standoffs for it, a radio frequency choke, a few capacitors, uh, a resistor, and some type of tuning variable capacitor. This two-section 365 receiving variable, that's a good place to start. Uh, you can get better capacitors as you move up. But uh, let's get something on the air here. Very simple for the 1929 Bruce Kelly Memorial CW Contest. The 80 meter Hartley oscillator is a classic first transmitter to get you introduced into the 1929 pine board world. And the Type 27 triode with its separate cathode connection is an inexpensive and simple way to get your feet wet building your first radio project. Or maybe it's your first old time ham radio project. The high voltage supply is very modest, very small transformer and at modest current, less than 50 milliamps. Now it still is dangerous. You can get a shock from this and the transmitter has exposed wires. 
but it's a shunt-fed power circuit with a choke and coupling cap that keeps the high voltage off most of the components, including that large coil that you'll wind using soft copper tubing. The tuning capacitor is also cold, so you can touch that as well without getting a shock. So you're going to be cutting a board roughly 7 by 12 inches, which acts as the chassis for the transmitter. So you need to gather some wood screws and standoffs and the Type 27 tube and its 5-pin socket. And uh, these sockets come in many styles, but it has to be one that you can easily connect to and stable. You want good stability with this build. The name of the game is mechanical stability. Nail everything down. The coil may even need to be supported by sort of a cradle made from a pair of dowels or plastic bars with end caps made of wood. And basically the coil lays in this cradle and that keeps it stable. Before we look at the parts list, let's go through the schematic diagram. Notice that I've drawn the schematic in such a way that shows the actual wire connections. Rather than a bunch of ground symbols representing a, collection, a connection to the metal chassis, since there's no chassis, there's no metal chassis, this type of diagram makes it easier to follow for a beginner. So there really is only one ground connection. Note the pin numbers on the tube socket. You'll want to use heavy wire like number 12 or number 10 solid. But the tube runs on 2.5 volts DC, which is a hard voltage to find unless you happen to have a variable DC supply. DC is fine, by the way, on that filament. Uh, an ordinary 5 or 6.3 transformer winding with a resistor to drop the voltage to 2.5 volts under load is the way most people go. R1, the grid leak resistor, is a 5 watt minimum. Really, you can get a 10 watt or a 20 watt wire wound. The larger the resistor, the more stability you'll have, the less chirp, and so on. But you can use your choice of ordinary caps for the bypass caps. A lot of people like to use the 630 volt orange drops or mylars to start out. And then when they find the period parts, they substitute in the period parts and see how it affects the transmit. Get the thing working properly, then begin to substitute in period parts so it starts to look like something from the 1920s. Also, the addition of the parasitic choke is a wink to stability. You can dispose of that and just run the wire from the choke to the plate and the uh, coupling capacitor. But I like to add parasitic uh, suppression devices on these transmitters. Let's take a look at the circuit. Some of you will recognize this as a Hartley oscillator. The type shown here is a shunt-fed Hartley. By shunt-fed, I mean that the power to the plate of the tube does not go through the tuned circuit's coil as with the series-fed design. The series-fed design actually had fewer parts, but it presented the operator to more practical danger as the big inductor would be hot with high voltage DC. So very early in the 1920s, the shunt-fed design using a choke and coupling capacitor quickly gained favor. As you can see, the center tap goes directly to ground. The center resonated and tapped coil is a clever phase reverser. Remember that the valve in the common cathode mode flips the phase by 180 degrees naturally. So for oscillation, we need to flip it back 180 more degrees to get it in phase for oscillation. The grid leak, consisting of a 270 picofarad and 10,000 ohm resistor, simply sets the class A bias that allows the circuit to start up and remain in oscillation. It really is as simple as that. The first ARRL Radio Amateur's Handbook from 1926 gave the user instructions on how to wind an appropriate RF choke. Using the simple solenoid winding method, almost exactly like we do with the main coil of a crystal radio. So right from the start, you could wind your own RF choke. The drawback of these simple solenoid style chokes is that they're optimized only for one band. This is not an issue if you're only doing 80 meters or 40 meters. You possibly could get one choke to work on both bands without much of an issue using this method. And by issue, I mean the choke not having enough reactance to be invisible to the main tuned circuit, or possibly having a series resonance right in band, which would prevent oscillation to start. 
Modern pie wound chokes are designed to work over a wider bandwidth, say from half a megahertz to 10 megahertz, or 1 megahertz to 29 megahertz, and avoid or at least move many of these resonances to unused parts of the shortwave spectrum. So no pie wound choke is perfect, and no choke is as perfect as the one you can make for yourself for one band. So let's press the key. Now the cathode is grounded and noise from the grid leak and tuned circuit and the whole world gets amplified and the oscillation immediately builds up. So in several milliseconds the oscillator will be at full amplitude. We need to get that power from the tuned circuit into the antenna. There's usually a 3 to 5 turn coupling loop that transfers the power from the oscillator's tuned circuit to the antenna. In this case we can assume a low impedance feed to a quarter wave wire or coax to a tuned antenna like a dipole. The Type 27 tube can be lit up with AC or DC without much trouble because it's indirectly heated, meaning it's got a cathode. It really was one of the first tubes widely available to have a cathode. So I showed you a regular receiving variable as the basis for the oscillator. A single section 365 puff cap will get you started and the Hartley uh, will tune fine. The problem is these smaller capacitors are not as stable as larger chunky capacitors that are used for transmitting operation. Their plate spacing is very close. Now at this very low power level of the 27 tube, especially if you start the oscillator, you know, around the 150 to 200 volt region, you will be able to have a capacitor like this work for you and you can get started with the oscillator and make contacts. But if you can get your hands on a beefier capacitor like this one here, see how this capacitor is built with the plates that are a lot wider spaced? And it's really solid. It's not a gigantic capacitor. It doesn't have to be a really big capacitor. This one will easily handle anything you can do with a Type 27 tube and it probably would work fine with a Type 10 as well. So these are just some hints on building your first oscillator. Don't be afraid to start with a broadcast variable just to get things moving. And if you have to pad across that capacitor uh, in order to make it tune smoother, for instance if you use one section of this capacitor you might want to put a 200 picofarad two or three kilovolt type uh, fixed capacitor across it to make the tuning easier. In the next video we'll wire this up and see if we can get something going. See if we can get a stable output on 80 meters. And uh, if we can get 80 meters to work maybe we'll try to do 40 meters with the type 27 triode.